In 1958, Ingmar Bergman's Wild Strawberries won the top award at Berlin. With his seventh seal, it ushered in a second golden age of Swedish cinema. In the film, Victor Sjöström plays an old professor looking back on his childhood. It was the last film of Victor Sjöström, one of the leading actors and directors during the first golden age. The man Karl Dreyer described as the father of the Swedish art film. New Year's Day 1918 saw the premiere of The Outlaw and His Wife in the most prestigious cinema in Stockholm, the Röder Kavan. When it opened in France, the critic Louis de Luc wrote, Here, without doubt, is the most beautiful film in the world. I would like to say that Swedish film had a beautiful filtering och en skildring av naturen, den nordiska människan sammanhanget med naturen, som inte hade någon annan motsvarighet, men som kom att verka mycket inspirerande på de europeiska regissörerna. Jag rappelle tous les films de Sjöström, tous ces films-là, nous les voyons. Ça faisait partie, alors là, d'une espèce d'élite de pensée et d'exécution cinématographique remarquable. Il y a eu toute une école suédoise qui a été capitale sur le plan de l'évolution de la dramaturgie cinématographique française. Le film a été shot en location in Obisco, in the north of Sweden. Sjöström plays the outlaw Berg Evint. Edith Erostov plays Halla, his wife. They were lovers off screen as well as on. Also, blev det stor förälskelse med en gång. Och sen gjorde de filmen och då hade de redan varit tillsammans länge och då var jag till och med i mammas mage när de filmade den. Och sen så småningom gifte de sig. De hade svårt med hon min mor hade inte fått skilsmässan klar för hon hade varit gift förut. Så det dröjde fem år innan de gifte sig. Och vi var med på bröllopet. Och neg med varsin ros och sa gratulerar. There is no such happy ending in the film. Fleeing the law, Halla kills her daughter rather than allowing her to be captured. Her remorse destroys her love for her husband. There is nothing left to live for. The story of Swedish cinema begins just ten years earlier in a small town called Kristianstad in the south of Sweden, with the formation of Svenska Bio. Economically backward, Sweden had for years been losing too many people to the United States. In 1910, a film was made on board an emigrant ship in the hope of discouraging emigration. Several such films were planned as part of a campaign. Svenska Bio's resources were limited. The film crew could afford only to go as far as Britain, and Hull was used to stand in for New York. The acting and direction were as crude as the melodramatic stories. Immigrants are shown cheated out of land, or drugged, robbed and dumped in the street. But by 1912, Sweden was showing a new confidence. Hitta 12 är väl egentligen det första viktiga året i den svenska 
strömfilmens historia. Då flyttade ett litet oansenligt biografbolag från den svenska landsorten till Stockholm. Öppnade kontor där. Ordnade en ateljé. Öppnade ett laboratorium också. Och började en medveten produktion. In Svenska Bios first year, this small group of men came together. They would bring Swedish films from a backward cottage industry to the forefront of European cinema. Moritz Stiller was a theatre director who had arrived in Sweden only two years earlier. A flamboyant Russian-Finnish Jew, an outsider three times over, he was employed as a director. Victor Sjöström was Stiller's opposite, though they became lifelong friends. He was a popular actor-manager in the theatre when he joined Svenska Bio. Charles Magnusson was the studio boss who recruited both these men. He started in newsreels, he appears in this shot. And he became the manager of this cinema. Experiences which proved invaluable to the success of Svenska Bio. His newsreel background was shared by the fourth great figure at the studio, cameraman Julius Jensen. Jensen's assistant was Gunnar Fischer, who would be Bergman's cameraman on Wild Strawberries. Jag vet att Julius och hans bror Henrik också i viss mån, de har skapat denna filmfotograferingstradition, den svenska traditionen, som sedan både min generation och generationen efter mig har medvetet eller omedvetet fört vidare. Jensen created not only the look, but the feel of Swedish cinema. His love of his native landscape is apparent. This rare glimpse of his home movies shows the same qualities as his fiction films. Jensen was cameraman for Stiller and Sjöström on many of their films. As the ambition of the filmmakers increased, Jensen transformed nature from a placid background to an active participant in their dramas. In The Phantom Carriage, death collects lost souls from the seabed. To create the eerie atmosphere, Jensen used multiple exposure, all of which had to be achieved in the camera. He talked often about how he had done these fullkomligt fantastic double photographs. He could do up to six or seven double photographs on the same film lens. So it was for his time a very advanced phototechnical work. One of Jensen's first pupils was his brother Henrik, who photographed Moritz Stiller's Johan. Stiller uses the elements to underscore the drama. The river is a constant theme. The wife embarks on a dangerous adventure with her lover. Johan, Matthias Tauber, takes her back. In a beautiful scene, Stiller and Henrik Jensen combine the actors, the calm river and the gentle evening light to resolve the emotional conflict of the film. Julius and Henrik Jensen worked together on Stiller's Gunnar Hedersaga on location in Jomtland. 
Freezing conditions were made worse by wind machines. A young southerner buys a herd of reindeer to stave off bankruptcy, but an accident causes a stampede and the lead reindeer to show its strength. Until 1914, Denmark had led Europe in film production. Famous for their high technical standards, the Nordisk studios in Copenhagen turned out a series of melodramas. They were as popular with Swedish audiences as American films would be later. Danes helped to launch the star system. Lili Beck, who would soon meet and marry Victor Sjöström. In 1912, Magnusson's team at Svenska Bio was headed by director Georg Afklerke, a former army officer and actor. Only one fragment of film survives from his time at the studio. This circus story was being made at the same time by Nordisk in Copenhagen. Circus films were popular, and no one made them better than Nordisk. Coincidentally, both films premiered on the same day in Stockholm. Despite the greater resources of Nordisk, Afklerka's film matches theirs in every way. This is the Danish version. This, the Swedish version. Afklerka fell out with Magnusson and left Svenska Bio at the end of the season in 1913. Just over a year later, he joined the Hasselblad studios in Jotunberg. Hasselblad were manufacturers of lenses. The quality of their equipment, combined with Afklerka's sense of composition, created strikingly photographed films. Afklerka made 31 films for Hasselblad, mainly social dramas in the Danish style. After this, he left Hasselblad and returned to the stage. At Svenska Bio, Victor Sjöström was given his first chance to direct. I had a message from Charlie Magnusson that I was going to give me a way to ask after a photograph of Jansson. Sjöström's first film as director was The Gardener. Julius Jensen was the cameraman, Moritz Stiller wrote the script. It was a love story with the Danish actress Lili Beck and Jöster Ekman. Their love will be destroyed by the jealousy of the boy's father, played by Sjöström, who, as director and actor, found himself even more frustrated by the cinema than by the limitations of the theatre. The camera was a fast speaker, but it didn't have to run as a millimeter. It didn't have to run up and down. 
Och för att man inte skulle komma utanför kameravinkeln då så, så var det ribbor som var utlagda på golvet. Och, och de fick man inte på några villkor att träda utanför för då blev man avklippt på mitten eller också så syntes man inte alls. The father orders the son to leave home. With the son away, the father has the girl to himself. The rape scene caused the film to be banned in Sweden. Distributed abroad, it was lost for over 70 years until this censored American version was found. The girl's life is ruined. Rejected by society, she falls into prostitution. Years pass and she returns to the scene of her downfall to end her life. Sjöström had wanted to make a film closer to the lives of ordinary people. His ambition was realised in a film that prompted a critic to write, Film can be art. Ingeborg Holm was based on the true story of a woman whose life is destroyed when her husband dies. Her children are taken away from her and she is sent to the poorhouse. When she is at last given a chance to see her baby boy again, he doesn't recognise her. The film had a powerful impact on Swedish society, which was far from the social democratic model of today. The outcry was so great that the poor law was reformed. The first time a film had ever affected a change in the law, it later influenced a young Ingmar Bergman. It had a very much with Sjöströms way to separate people. Jag, jag var så djupt fängslad av de här långa, tydliga, skulpterade bilderna. Viktor Sjöström placerat människorna i bilderna på ett sådant sätt så att de förhåller sig kolossalt plastiska. Det finns hela tiden en dramatik i det som vi kallar för sceneriet, i, i koreografi. When her son returns many years later, he finds that her grief has driven her mad. Now, in an echo of the earlier scene, it is she who does not recognize him. He shows her an old photograph of herself. Hilda Bergström was a leading actress at the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm, the most prestigious theatre in Sweden. The cinema was looked down upon in many countries, but in Sweden, actors moved happily between the stage and screen. Jöster Ekman did as much work in the theatre as in films. 
Despite its theatrical connections, Swedish film acting developed a fresh, naturalistic quality very early. Mary Jonsson was the most famous star to be created by Afklerke at Hasselblad Studios. Her performances were compared to those of Lillian Gish. Lars Hansen combined film work with his position of leading actor at the Royal Dramatic Theatre. He married Karin Molander, who brought her beauty and wit to a series of sophisticated comedies by Moritz Stiller. Here she plays the secretary, who is more than a match for Victor Sjöström's amorous scriptwriter. The film was so popular they made a sequel. These early years at Svenska Bio were exciting times for everyone. Stiller and Sjöström each directed more than 30 films between 1912 and 1916. Most were quick commercial pictures, mainly melodramas and comedies. Sjöström preferred dramas. Stiller was drawn to comedy. Stiller mocks ladies' fashions in this comedy made in 1913. It starred Lili Ziedner in her first film, recreating the burlesque comedy style for which she was already famous in the theatre. In 1916 was a turning point. Svenska Bio's small group of film people were enjoying an enormous success. Yet both Stiller and Sjöström missed the artistic challenge of the theatre. Their contracts were coming to an end. Magnusson had to do something to keep his team together, especially at a time when cinema audiences were increasing. Magnusson's response was to change radically the sort of films his company made. Under that time, I was a plan. It was on hur en stor drift med biograf och film skulle kunna uppläggas. Som grundvala, äh, grundvala ansåg jag borde först uppbygga sin kedja biograf för landet runt. Röda Kvarn i Stockholm är en av de teater som kom till på detta sätt. Röda Kvarn opened on December the 30th 1915 and still operates as a cinema. Charles Magnusson som var centralgestalten i den här svenska film han hade en bestämd avsikt med den här biografen han ville med den här fina biograf kunna skapa en ny biokultur, en ny filmkultur han ville alltså att vi skulle komma i nivå med nationalscenen Terje Wien by Henrik Ibsen was Magnussons first attempt at a new film culture Sjöström directed and played the hero, based on the first script of a young Gustav Morlander. The dramatic poem is set during the Napoleonic Wars. The British are blockading Norway. Terje Wien's family is starving, so he sails to Denmark to get food for his wife and children. On the way back, he is spotted by the British.
taken before the British officer, he is condemned to nine years in prison. When the film was shot, British warships were again blockading Europe. In Germany, where starvation was widespread, the film was marketed as part of the anti-British propaganda campaign. But Sjöström was more interested in the theme of redemption and forgiveness. Terje returns home to find his wife and baby have died of starvation. Years later, fate gives Terje Vien the chance to avenge his family's death. The British officer's ship is caught in a storm near Terje's village. Terje sets off to rescue the ship, not knowing who is its captain. He recognizes the officer who captured him so many years before. He is tempted to kill him and the rest of his family. But as in so many of Sjöström's films, it is the innocence of a child which brings an adult to see the truth. Det blev också den dyraste filmen överhuvudtaget som hade gjorts i Sverige den gången. Men det lönade sig, visade sig mycket snabbt. För när filmen såldes till Amerika så bara i garanti i kontaktets undertecknande fick Svenska Bio lika mycket som hela filmen hade kostat i inspelning. The success of Terje Vien led Magnusson to make more literary films. The Swedish author Selma Lagerlöf signed a five-picture deal. In 1909, she had become the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Lagerlöf's novels helped to shape Magnusson's new Swedish national cinema, with their powerful stories, rural settings, and strong moral dilemmas. At the Röda Kavan were premiered all the Lagerlöf films. Girl from the Marshcroft, De Nungen, The Sons of Ingmar, and the phantom carriage Schakalin. It was the fourth Lagerlöf novel to be directed by Victor Sjöström. Sjöström plays David Holm, who, because he dies at the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve, is offered a second chance of life by death's messenger. Holm is a ne'er-do-well who has destroyed not only his own life, but the lives of his family and those most dear to him. förkrossad i typ på mig. Jag var djupt skakad av då den filmen. Jag vet inte för att jag förstod den eller för någonting annat utan helt enkelt tror jag det att den den inverkade på mig med sin oerhörda kinematografiska kraft. Alltså det var en total känsloupplevelse för mig. Jag, jag kommer fortfarande ihåg den. Jag kommer precis ihåg vissa sekvenser, vissa bilder som gjorde ett kolossalt intryck på mig. Death's messenger shows him the consequence of his actions in an effort to save his soul. The climactic scene comes when he is brought before his wife, played by Hilda Bergström. He watches, powerless, as she prepares to kill herself and their three children.
David's repentance saves him and earns him the chance to save his family. Sjöström was Lagerlöf's favourite director. He tried to remain faithful to the spirit of the novels. For him, the integrity of the characters was at the heart of the films. Moritz Stiller had a more aggressive and dynamic style. He saw her novels as an opportunity to tell sophisticated adventure stories. This was Stiller's first adaptation of a Lagerlöf novel, which he rewrote with his collaborator Gustav Molander. Set in the 16th century, the film chronicles the flight of three ruthless Scottish mercenaries from Gripsholm Castle. After pillaging the manor of Sir Arna, they escape across the ice with his treasure. Sir Archie and his men leave Sir Arna's house in ruins, having killed everyone they could find. Stiller used to say he made his films twice, first on the set and then in the cutting room. There is only one survivor, Elsa Lil, played by Mary Jonsson. Elsa Lil has fallen in love with a stranger when she discovers he is Sir Archie, the murderer of her family. Stiller's exploration of their emotions makes this blighted romance one of the most moving in Swedish cinema. Films of Stiller and Sjöström were attracting increasing audiences abroad. The most commercially successful Svenska Bio film was Stiller's The Song of the Scarlet Flower. The film starred Lars Hansen as Olof, a charismatic rural Don Juan. Based on a novel by a Finnish writer, it was adapted by Stiller and Molander into a series of adventures and set pieces. The most spectacular is when Olaf wagers he can ride the rapids on a log.
This music by the Finnish composer Amos Janfeldt was the first score specially commissioned by Svenska Beer. Svenska Bio's success meant small independent studios couldn't survive. Several of them merged in 1918 to become Scandia Films, a new rival to Svenska Bio. Following the success of his first film, Puss in Boots, Scandia's main director, John Brunius, began an adaptation of a popular Hungarian novel. It starred Niels Aster, Jöster Ekman, and the young review actress, Violet Molitor. Björkviksarna, det var ju varma kärleksscener där med Jöste Ekman. Och det, det, var, det var ju stor film som man kunde säga vad man ville. Men det var aldrig repetitioner, aldrig kollationering för vilket är vid teatern. Så man visste aldrig riktigt, men jag köpte boken och läste den och tog ut vissa saker som jag tyckte det det blir nog filmat det där. Och, och det, var, det var sant. Så jag hade lite stöd på det. Så. Det var Nils Aster och jag som skulle vigas. Det var katolsk präst, alltså vixel. Och då sa John Brunius, jag ska inte ta en massa statister och betala utan jag ska bjuda in hela adelskalendern och det gjorde han och där kom de allihopa och var väldigt eleganta i långa klänningar och fick inte ett öre <laughs> Brunius och Scandia var ambitious but unoriginal Their next production bore all the hallmarks of a Svenska Bio film. It was set in the beautiful landscape of Norway. Against this rural backdrop, the film tells the story of the two lovers who come from rival families. Brunius even recruited two Svenska Bio stars to play the lead roles, Lars Hansen and Karin Molander. It was a large budget affair which established Brunius's reputation. In 1919, Magnusson decided that the best way to deal with a new rival was to swallow it. Svenska Bio and Scandia merged to become Svensk Filmindustri. New studios built at Resunda outside Stockholm were intended as the most sophisticated in Europe. Svensk Filmindustri recruited from Norway, Finland and Denmark and was by far the largest filmmaker in Scandinavia. The opening up of export markets after the war brought a new wave of American films and with them their stars. The King and Queen of Hollywood, Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford, visited Rosunda. Now, at the moment of its greatest glory, Svensk film industry was also sowing the seeds of its downfall. By encouraging the showing of American films, SF made money, but reduced the appeal of Swedish films. Stiller responded with a sophisticated comedy inspired by the early Cecil B. DeMille. It was designed to appeal to the new, post-war audience. It starred Karin Molander, Anders de Waal and Tora Teja.
It was an international success. The new studio needed new directors. It looked abroad, to Denmark. Despite Danish neutrality, Nordisk had suffered during the war because of its close links to the German film industry. SF recruited one of its directors, Carl Dreyer. Dreyer was a journalist and critic, as well as filmmaker, who would make his name internationally in France at the end of the silent era with the remarkable Passion of Joan of Arc. Through Sjöström's work, wrote Dreyer, film was let into art's promised land. This admiration can be seen in Dreyer's first film abroad, SF's The Parson's Widow. The film was shot on location in Norway with Swedish, Danish and Norwegian actors. It tells the story of a young man who has to marry the widow of his predecessor if he wishes to be the village parson. Unfortunately, he already loves another. The widow has buried three previous husbands. The authentic feel of the 17th century was achieved partly by filming in an open-air folk museum. Stilen kom frem af sig selv, da vi jo arbejdede i i de gamle huse fra det 17. og 18. århundrede. Vi opnåede at vi havde dofterne med i i billederne. Det var ret uanmeldeligt dengang i dekorationer, der er bygget op i atelier. Der er jo sjældent dofter. Og så var det der, når vi så ud gennem vinduerne, så så vi landskabet udenfor. Så det gav et, et for den tid i hvert fald ualmindeligt ægthedspræg i filmen. The lovers begin by plotting against the widow. They even try to frighten her to death. Margaret realizes she is soon to die. She remembers her youth and her own first love. She forgives the lovers who are filled with remorse. The actress Hildur Kahlberg was herself dying when she made the film. SF's second Danish recruit was Benjamin Christensen. SF bought a studio for Christensen in Copenhagen. He worked there for three years on just one film. semi-documentary, it linked witchcraft, religion and hysteria in a series of brilliant sketches. The nudity and blasphemy caused outrage in many countries and censorship problems coupled with high production costs led to the film's financial failure. Love's Crucible, Vem Derma, 
was Sjöström's only film in 1922. It was written by his friend and collaborator Hjalmar Bergman. Set in 14th century Florence, Jenny Hasselqvist plays a woman accused of murdering her husband. She submits to a trial by fire. She sees a vision of her husband. She remembers him as he was on their wedding day. He leads her through her ordeal. Vem Derma was an artistic success in America, and Sjöström, unhappy with the increasing bureaucracy at SF, had received an offer from Louis B. Mayer. With his family, he left for Hollywood in 1923 with the encouragement of Charles Magnusson. The visit was intended to be temporary. He had come here as a one-year-old with his family. Och där bodde han i många år tills de kom tillbaka till Sverige. Så han hade flytande, talade flytande amerikanska. Och det var ju naturligtvis en stor hjälp för honom när han sen fick sitt kontrakt. För att det var absolut inga svårigheter med språket. Och han blev väldigt älskad där. De brukade ju säga, de brukar kalla honom Jesus. Det var hans nickname för han var så snäll. Och de sa. Where's Jesus now? Oh, Jesus is in the men's room. It was so underbart and that's the big name. For that he was really a good and snell and let to work with. In 1924, Moritz Stiller made the last great Swedish film of the silent era, The Atonement of Jester Berling. Based on a Selma Lagerlöf novel, Stiller created a grandiose epic in two parts. He takes a minor scene of the book, the burning of Ekebu Castle, and creates a stunning climactic set piece. Thirty-four sets were built, all to be burnt. It was the most expensive Swedish film ever. But the film is most famous because it introduced one actress to the world, Greta Garbo. She was just 18 years old. Garbo's career had begun as a shop assistant in a Stockholm department store. She had got a chance modeling clothes in a couple of publicity films. This won her a part in an Eric Petschler comedy. A natural talent led to a place at the Royal Dramatic Theatre School, where she met Mimi Pollock. They became close friends. Så blev jag hemsko vän med Garbo redan första dagen när vi satt vid bordet och skulle presentera oss vilka vi var. Och vi var sju stycken och alla hade vi gått i så kallad high school eller vad det heter utom Greta. När hon reste sig upp och blev blodröd i ansiktet och sa folkskola. Greta var inte så smal alls på den tiden som hon blev. Efter just Berlings saga eller under den tiden därför att hon var lite fyllig så där och hon blev tillsagd av Moje att magra om hon skulle få rollen så hon satt åt spenat från morgon till kväll och var så sjuk så hon höll på att bli galen men jag vet inte hur många kilo hon gick ner hon blev smal och sen har bibehållit detta The defrocked priest Jöster Berling and Elizabeth have fallen in love but she is already married.
In Garber's first dramatic role, her star quality is already apparent. The film was a success. Stiller left for the premiere in Berlin, and he took Greta Garbo with him. Neither of them made a film in Sweden again. In Berlin, Stiller was offered a contract by Louis B. Mayer, the head of the newly formed Metro Golden Mayer, visiting Berlin at the time. He wanted to sign up Stiller, who insisted that his protege, Garbo, be contracted as well. In June, they sailed to the US to join a growing band of exiles in Hollywood. Already in Hollywood, were Karen Molander, Victor Sjöström, Lars Hansen. Karl Dreyer went to France, Mary Jonsson went to Germany, as did Benjamin Christensen before joining the Scandinavian community in Hollywood. The Swedish film industry couldn't survive this hemorrhage of talent. SF had fallen into the hands of financiers and accountants. Charles Magnusson was no longer head of the studio, but just one of a bureaucratic management team. Julius Jensen remained working with a new generation of directors, such as Gustav Molander. John Brunius planned an ambitious production to rival Hollywood. For this spectacular drama, Brunius tempted Jester Ekman back from Germany. Large budgets, expensive design, spectacular set pieces, and a box office failure. Hollywood knew how to fashion Swedish history better than Sweden herself. MGM transformed Garbo into an icon recognized around the world. But Hollywood was less kind to her mentor, Moritz Stiller. In 1928, Stiller returned to Sweden a sick and broken man. He had always been an outsider, and Hollywood had been unwilling to accommodate his eccentric talent. In Stockholm, he was admitted to the Sophia Hemet Hospital. Sjöström visited him there. He recalls, Stiller wanted to see me. I was with him for more than an hour, but he only talked about indifferent things. Then the nurse came in and said she could not allow me to stay any longer. Stiller suddenly got desperate. He grabbed my arm in despair and would not let me go. He said, I want to tell you a story for a film. It will be a great film. It is about human beings, and you are the only one who can do it. I was so moved I didn't know what to say. Yes, Moya was all I could stammer. I will be with you first thing in the morning, then you can tell me. I left him crying in the arms of the nurse. There was no morning. Next day he was almost unconscious. He tried to talk, but although I put my ear close to his mouth, I could not make out what he said. He only kept staring at me. A day or two later he passed away. The first golden age of Swedish cinema was over. <laughs>